Hey, Jace. Good evening, everyone. Oh. This is Mayor Byers, and the only one I can see at this point is Chase and the shared screen. Is there something else I should be seeing? Sure. Uh, there's a whole bunch of us here. Huh. Yeah. Uh, Mayor, sometimes in the upper right, there's a little box called the view. And if you click on that, you can sometimes go to um, side by side or full. And it'll, it'll. Oh, there we go. Oh, I see everybody now. Thank you. <laughs> I was beginning to think I was the only one on. <laughs> Well, and it's amazing that I was able to help you, as everyone can tell. <laughs> Andre, you have to give yourself more credit. Come on. <laughs> no. That's funny. hard one. Hard one. Through Although screen. I know that we've all had the the unique opportunity of moving from one meeting to another on the same platform. And despite doing nothing except for clicking leave and enter, it doesn't work. <laughs> yes. Uh, Commissioner McKinney, your your uh, volume still is low, so apologies, but um, just wanted to make sure you're heard. I will talk really loud. <laughs> get your IT people to get you a new speaker. I know, I know. Where are those folks? I don't. Anyone have a ten year old they can spare? <laughs> Well, we have about 17, 17, 18 folks on now. That's a good number. Is this better? Talk a little bit more. Is this better? Yes. To me, it is. Sounds pretty good. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. I got a smile out of Dr. Cleary, so I'm going to say that, that, <laughs> that means he heard me, right, doctor? <laughs> I did indeed. Good evening. <laughs> Well, it's 5.30, so welcome everyone. Uh, I'll call a meeting to order and uh, we'll do uh, ask uh, Ryan Ibach uh, to uh, do introductions of guests and staff. Okay, Dr. Sean Cleary, city, citizen representative. Here. Commissioner Amanda McKinney. Present. Commissioner LaDonna Lindy. Here. Mayor Patricia Byer, city representative. Evening. Council member Nyla Duvall, city representative. Here. Dr. Dave Atterbury, citizen representative. He's not on the meeting just yet. Okay. okay. Um, Commissioner Ron Anderson. Here. Okay. Uh, Andre Fresco, executive director. Here. Myself, Ryan Ibach, chief operating officer. Chase Porter, senior finance manager. Here. Melissa Sixberry, Director of Disease Control. Here. Lillian Bravo, Director of Public Health Partnerships. Here. John McGee, Director of Environmental Health. Here. Good evening. Nathan Johnson, Local Emergency Response Coordinator. Here. Dr. Larry Yecka, Health Officer. Present. Uh, Wendy Garcia, Public Health Technician. Here. Victoria Reyes, Administrative Assistant. Present. James Elliott, Yakima Health District Attorney. Good evening. And then Dr. Atterbury. Okay. Victoria, have, we, have, have you been in contact with Dr. Atterbury? Um, I have. He did confirm for the meeting, so I can give him a call and see um, if he'll be joining us. Okay. Thank you. And then if anyone else um, is present, um, please, in the chat box, state your name and any affiliation. And we are also streaming this live on, um, streaming it live. <laughs> Is that our Facebook page? <laughs> yes, it's the Facebook page. All right, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, we'll move on to the review of submitted uh, public written comments and Ryan. Okay, we do have eight uh, submitted written comments. And uh, just like in the past, if any staff or, or board members want to address um, any of them, of the written comments or answer any of them during the meeting, then they're free to do so. So the first one is from Dr. Mark Farley. I am a physician who has worked in the Yakima Valley for 31 years in primary care, and I have worked with both Dr. Barg and Dr. Atterbury. Dr. Barg is an excellent physician with outstanding credentials and is infectious disease and public health background is, is extremely well qualified for the health officer position. 
he would be the best choice for the position. Dr. Atterbury, on the other hand, has no qualifications for the position. Neurosurgeons have no training or experience in infectious disease or public health, other than limited exposure in medical school many years ago, and are focused on surgical treatments of neurosurgical problems, a very small part of the healthcare world. Several recent decisions of the board regarding mass use in school and the high school COVID vaccine competition are clear evidence that some of the board members who supported these unfortunate decisions do not have the qualifications required to fulfill the responsibilities of the positions. Next one is from Jeremy Hines. Proclamation 20-60 is a Yakima County specific proclamation. Proclamation 20-60 says that it includes all amendments to Proclamation 20-03. Proclamation 20-03.2 allows masks with drapes for students and staff in K-12 through if a cloth mask is not tolerated if ordered by the governor. No other requirements are listed. Proclamation 20-25.13 in order of the governor references document DOH 820-105, which references document DOH 820-131. DOH 820-131 says masks with drapes for students in K through 12 may also be used if a cloth mask is not tolerated. No other requirements are listed. Tolerated as defined by Webster Merriam Dictionary is to endure or resist the action of, of something such as drug or food without serious side effects or discomfort. Exhibit uh, physio physiological tolerances for. The word not means the opposite of the word it precedes. DOH 20-131 could then say masks with drapes in K through 12 may also be used if the cloth mask is uncomfortable. There's no medical qualification in DOH 820-131. Uh, next one is from Jennifer Hines. As a parent, I'm really struggling to figure out the rules of the Yakima County and Washington State, for that matter, are using to determine what's safe, what's safe for our community, particularly when it comes to masking. I'm looking for specific data that is being used to make decisions, especially for our children. Could you please provide the data being used to make these decisions specifically regarding masking in school? If we are truly driven by science, where are the studies and data driven, driving the choices we are making? Are we researching the mental and behavioral, behavioral health impacts that these mandates are having on our children under 18 and adults for that matter? If there are no state mask mandates, what's the purpose in forcing our students to be masked? especially if the data does not show that young students are transmitting COVID. Furthermore, why is it that every school in the Valley is interpret interpreting the rules differently? Some of our private schools are using face shields or no masks at all, while other public schools are allowing masks to be worn outdoors or during sports practice, while others are allowing gators and other schools are not. In short, I would really like to see the research and data that are driving our choices. Currently, YHD is placing additional restrictions over and above the CDC, DOH, and governor's office. I'm curious to see what data we are using to make those decisions. If we are true science-based, then where's the data? If we can't produce the data easily, why are we imposing the restrictions? We can and must do better for our kids. They are our future and we have to do better for them. Forcing them to be masked in the classroom and on, con on, and on campus is not what is best for our kids. Please make it a family decision. Masks should be optional for both staff and students. Let families make these choices for themselves. Uh, next one is from Neil Hess. I've tried multiple times to set to have sets of mass data reviewed by this board that show that there's no correlation between mass mandate and reduced COVID numbers with no follow through or communication. The attached data set actually demonstrates the correlation between mass mandates and, and anywhere from a 2% to 15% higher rate of COVID infection in schools that have mass mandates. Our citizens, teachers, and children deserve quality data to demonstrate that masking is actually the best interest of the health of those who are in, in the schools every day. I call on every citizen to contact this board regularly and demand data. It's not good enough. It is not good enough for this board to blindly follow the state and federal guidelines. Those bodies are fallible and now more than ever need to be scrutinized by our local magistrates. With something as important as public health, this board needs to show that it has done its due diligence and, and is making its decisions, not solely on recommendations, but on hard data. Next one is from Dr. James Lindstrom. As a re retired primary care physician who practiced for over 30 years in Yakima, I'd like to voice my support for either Dr. Bard or Dr. Kate for the Yakima Health District Health Officer. As you know, Dr. Barg has the extensive background in infectious disease and Dr. Kate has been a long serving primary care physician in the community. Both of those backgrounds provide pertinent experience for the position. 
Next one is from Doug Lewis. I'm writing to first express my appreciation for the health department staff members who are all working hard to guard the health of the people of our valley. I also want to express my concern regarding the hiring of the new health officer for Yakima County. I'm aware that Dr. Kate and Dr. Barg are the candidates who are highly qualified in the area of public health, and I believe either of them would be a choice that sends the message that the health of our community is the highest priority to the Board of Health. <laughs> Next one is from Mike Paulson. I support both Dr. Sarah Kate and Dr. Neil Barg over Dr. Atterbury for the simple reason that, to me, their qualifications and experience clearly better support the public health mission of the Yakima Health District. And the last one is from Dr. William Starr. First of all, I want to thank you and all your staff members for the, of the Department of Health for all the hard work you have all done over the years, especially during the serious challenge of the past 16 months. I am concerned that the Board of Health selects the most professionally qualified person to serve on the board. This is not a political appointment, but a medical and public health position and therefore should be filled by someone who has both experience and training in public health preferably with a master's degree in public health or licensed specialist as an infectious disease physician. With that in mind, I would highly recommend either Dr. Sarah Kate or Dr. Neil Bard to fulfill the role on behalf of the health of our community. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, now we will move on to unfinished business. And uh, I just wanted to register myself as being present uh, if I could. Oh, yes, sir. Thanks. Thank you for checking in. Thank you for joining uh, us, Dr. Atterbury. Next, we'll move on to uh, Andre Fresco and uh, compensation. Yes, good evening. Uh, thank you for your time, for joining us. Uh, hello to the board members and certainly to the public. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, I wanted to discuss uh, COVID compensation. Uh, at our last meeting, Dr. Cleary had raised the issue of compensation. Uh, for additional hours worked. Uh, we've done some work on comparables. Um, there is precedent for um, reimbursing for the exceedingly long hours that have um, happened during the COVID response. Our office has been keeping track of hours since uh, January 1st. And we did some research. Uh, Ryan took the lead on a lot of that, certainly with uh, Chase in our office. And we've determined a number of things. The first is that the State Department of Health has, uh, has policies in place now to reimburse uh, members of their incident management team that are working, who are exempt staff, but working overtime. And that's being reimbursed um, at an overtime rate. And additionally, uh, we have colleagues in our county who are also in that same situation. We recently had the, the privilege of working with the Emergency Management Agency uh, or OEM as it's referred to, the Office of Emergency Management, and Tony Miller specifically, who worked uh, with uh, in a command role with our response at the FEMA site. And uh, my understanding is that his board has approved uh, compensation for overtime work as well. So we have a local precedent and also the state allowing that. I share this with you because we've been doing research on this issue and uh, certainly um, recognize the tremendous uh, commitment um, and willingness of our directors specifically to tackle really difficult issues on behalf of the community and that has required a great deal of overtime. So we are working now with the state uh, because we want to make certain that uh, if we applied for a reimbursement for those hours that they would actually be allowable expenses covered. Um, the expectation would be that uh, there would be no local cost. Uh, our expectation is that the compensation would come from the state through federal reimbursement channels. Uh, we have funding streams that I think will allow that. And Ryan has been working with members of the fiscal team at the State Department of Health on that. I've left messages with the uh, finance director for the State Department of Health because I'd like to ensure that that is the case. Uh, so if we find that that is allowable, that it is certainly meets with their expectations and we have both a local and a state comparable, what I'd like to do uh, is move forward with directing salary changes um, as the administrative officer for our directors and honoring and reimbursing uh, their overtime during uh, the last six months. So that would be the plan for our directors. I did want to share with you that um, I'm not at liberty to do that for myself. 
Uh, so the hours of overtime that I worked would have to be something that I discussed with the board and I may do that now, or we could do that in the future, but I would be looking to the board to either authorize me uh, to do that or to take a, uh, a board vote on, on uh, reimbursing for myself. So I wanted to create the opportunity to have a more involved discussion, answer any questions you have if there's things that we've overlooked and then continue to do the research and confirming uh, the reimbursement channels from the state. And happy to entertain any questions if you have any. This is Dr. Clary. Andre, uh, can you address the, the source of funding for the Office of Emergency Management and whether that would also apply, whether that would be FEMA uh, funding? Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Clary, the FEMA reimbursement is happening, as I understand it, for the Office of Emergency Management. They have an exceedingly um, directed and, and uh, more involved process. We already have funding streams, uh, the boxing the virus, as it's referred to, and also the CARES Act funding. We have funding streams that are, are allowing it. And what, when we've been in discussions with uh, the State Department of Health, they've actually directed us towards those funding streams. Ryan, would you like to get in more specifics since you've had those conversations? Yeah, so I've been in conversation with uh, Sean Roberts, who's the program manager for the Office of Financial Services for the State Department of Health. And, for, and with Ethan Peace, who's the incident management um, team finance section chief. And he has sent me um, information as far as that uh, incident management team exempt, um, non-representative, non-overtime um, um, uh, employees, staff um, are, are getting time and a half for any, any hours over 40 hours. And also sent me the documentation um, from the federal register that, that's where it states that you can pay overtime and um, and hazard pay for em employees that are exempt from staff. So Dr. Cleary, our expectation would be to follow the direction of the State Department of Health. Uh, we did mention FEMA reimbursement. They actually said that it would be a simpler process since we've already received the funding sources, the streams of funding, if you will, uh, from the State Department of Health. So we'll follow their direction, but it is a similar reimbursement process, following the same policies of allowing overtime reimbursement for those who, as Ryan said, are exempt staff. Any further comment? Uh, yeah, if I could okay. ask a question. Uh, Go ahead. Just, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so all the employees that you're talking about that are in question, these are directors and as such, they are all exempt employees? Well, we have exempt, all of our directors, uh, yes, are exempt. We do have a number of staff who are also exempt who've been working to support us um, in this capacity too. So there would be a number of people, but minimal numbers of hours. This is specifically uh, geared towards supporting uh, people like myself and our directors and people like Nathan Johnson. And Commissioner Lindy, the, our union staff, due to their contract, they have worked overtime and they do get paid overtime because it's part of their, their CBA. Okay, that's okay. Very good. That, that's kind of what I was assuming. Uh, I guess my only comment, yeah, and I'm just, uh, not that I'm trying to diminish the work that's been done because I know everybody there has, has put in a lot of long hours. Just uh, we would want to have the, insur the assurance that uh, this would be in fact allowable since uh, typically in most circumstances, exempt is by definition a salaried position. Yes, extraordinary circumstances, and uh, that's one of the reasons we want to do the research, because we were not aware that there was an allowable policy. So thank yeah, you. Okay. I, I would ask Andre, my follow. question oh, is, oh, sorry, um, you're talking about a six-month six period from January 1st up until June 30th when the state opens. Is that what we're talking about? Well, actually, my understanding is that the uh, hours, the potential for those hours uh, is all the way through December 31st of this year. Um, I don't anticipate um, tremendous hours um, after the summer, but I do, uh, do want to be honest with you that if there were changes and we didn't have to work excessive hours, that would be part of it. Um, again, our workload has changed. Uh, it was far, far heavier. Um, this is not about uh, financial generation. It's about recognizing the you know, intense commitment that's been made. But as I understand it, the, um, the policy is through the end of December 31st. Thank you for clarifying that. And I also did not mean to diminish anything. I just want a clarification. Uh, I know that the tremendous amount of work that the, uh, the staff has been doing this last uh, year and longer. So thank you. 
Yes, thank you, ma'am. And Commissioner McKinney, I believe you had a question. Uh, yes, I just I, I wanted to say that uh, again, um, leading with what Mayor Byers and Commissioner Lindy have said is not diminishing the hard work, but this is something that, as you can imagine, has come up before uh, recently. Uh, and uh, we are currently in the county uh, having, you know, council look into this as well, because there is actually some significant uh, legality to this and whether or not it's allowed because of the exempt status and the precedent that it sets. Uh, and, and I would ask that Mr. Elliott be involved. Uh, I'm sure that he will be, but I would just ask that he be involved and if need be, uh, maybe seek it, uh, some collaboration with employment um, council at the county or whomever is appropriate. Uh, and then just one note, I know that you made a note about an approval for uh, through emergency management. And I would just ask um, Commissioner Anderson to comment on whether or not that's an accurate statement to state at this time. It's uh, right now it's uh, on hold as far as that's concerned. The uh, the state auditing uh, auditing officers are uh, uh, going are in review of that right now. So I don't know how long that's going to take. But uh, uh, Charles Ross asked to have that audited uh, to make sure and to clarify uh, the circumstances of all, where all of the funding is going to come from and how much and those kinds of details. So that's in process. And I just yes. asked that to be made, no, uh, Director Fresco, again, because it's, you know, there is no doubt uh, that, that there was an immense amount of effort um, because it wasn't just while you were there, you took it home, uh, just much like our law enforcement. <laughs> you know, you, you took it home definitely if you got to go home. Uh, so we recognize that. Uh, but that was something I can say that personally was came as a surprise when we recently discovered in the last couple of days that this apparently is something that is being uh, brought up uh, in, in as lawyers do, bring things up uh, about setting precedent and paying for exempt employees. <laughs> Mr. Elliott, I got a smile out of you. Uh, we want to do the right thing, and we want to also do the right thing for the taxpayers. And mm -hmm. that is the, that is what we must do, is we must make sure that we are uh, following all the rules. And, and I hope uh, that we're able to discover uh, that we're able to, to, to do the right thing. Uh, but I just would caution that we want to make sure that Mr. Elliott and his counterparts are giving us the green light uh, so that we can uh, assure our taxpayers that we did the right thing for them. Yes, thank you. Uh, one of the things that we uh, have often done throughout this, and we're actually beginning our audit here at the, at the um, Yakima Health District, and we have talked at length with auditors throughout the year, but specifically in the last week about the fact that we've had multiple funding streams and multiple circumstances that are not the norm for what we normally do. Um, our goal in 2020 was to yeah perform well, but 2021 as well, we want to make sure that we meet and exceed auditing standards. Uh, so I assure you that we'll be having those conversations with the auditor's office, with the State Department of Health, with our colleagues, and certainly Mr. Elliott. The goal is to ensure that uh, everything is credible and everything meets policy. So thank you. A question, uh, if you could, Andre, could you direct the accountant uh, to just project what uh, any payments would do to the current uh, annual budget and then so we can have that at the next meeting uh, so that assuming that it went through uh, what that would do to the budget and then assuming that it didn't go through what that would mean to the budget so that we can have some data to make a decision based on. Yes, thank you. Dr. Edebrey, um, our goal again at some point will be to amend our budget because we actually have so many funding streams that have come in. So the budget that we have, that, that you as a board approved or actually the previous board approved uh, was is smaller than the funding streams that we currently have. And so we will have to have an amendment, but this is certainly going to fit well within that and we're happy to share that information. Uh, any other questions? I would just say that uh, for benefit of, of thinking outside of the box here, that the reason why, uh, even though it's clear to anyone watching how hard the health district staff has worked, the reason why attorneys look at it this, this way with a question mark is because there are also exempt employees out there who are not working in the health capacity, who because of COVID had had also to do a lot of extra work. Uh, and as soon as you start uh, creating one group uh, who is able to have um, extraordinary circumstances uh, to be paid outside of class, 
uh, it certainly opens up other employers uh, to be susceptible to, to having that uh, requirement made of them and they were not or are not eligible for reimbursement from the state or federal government. So it's not that people um, are not acknowledging the hard work, but there are some legal questions involved and I just wanna make sure that we're clear on that, that we're supportive of the health district staff. Thank you so much. And uh, to your point, uh, Mayor Byers, uh, this is something that could potentially go on through December 31st. But again, uh, we, we, we only know of the hours that we've worked so far. We, my goal, um, my hope is that things will, um, will be realized differently throughout the summer and um, things will be far less um, deadline oriented and, and prone to long hours. So thank you. Thank you for that. Let me ask one more question. At this point, is, is this just information for the board? And are you looking for direction from the board in terms of moving forward? Uh, well, I wanted to share this openly with you. I didn't plan to make a decision hastily around the issue of giving, granting this to the staff. I think, again, as an administrative function, uh, once we have the green light from the State Department of Health Finance Director, from Mr. Elliott, um, that we feel comfortable that it meets audit standards. I'd like to move ahead with that. But again, for me and the reimbursement for my hours worked, I would never presume that for myself. So I'm happy to bring more information to the board at the next meeting. Because again, um, we want full disclosure to the board about um, our financial processes. Thank you. Thank you. I just um, did. I just wanted to uh, had a clarifying question. Um, how far back are you looking from the hours worked? January first mm -hmm. of this year or last year? Yes, just this year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Bob. you. Any further questions? Thank so, you. So, okay, uh, Andre. Then you'll move it forward to. Uh, uh, next meeting with more information and uh, then we can uh, go from there. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll move on now to uh, a proposal uh, for introducing uh, any information or topic mm -hmm. um, as, as read there or as written there for, uh, under B, uh, any new business brought up during the Board of Health meeting that is not on the agenda may be discussed at the Board of Health meeting, but no action may be taken until the following Board of Health meeting. Uh, I propose that, and this is uh, for purposes of normal business, uh, that would give, uh, the, give the board and staff opportunity to uh, review the topic and to do some vetting, make sure that everybody's comfortable with it so that we can make a determination uh, based on uh, sound information. So that's, that's my proposal that I would like to move forward to next meeting. Are you putting that in, in terms of a motion, Mr. Anderson? Uh, yes. Yes, okay. I would second the motion then, so we can discuss that. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? I would just I would just say that you know in the city we have a similar policy that under new business we can only make a motion to put something on a future agenda, and for a couple of reasons number one to make sure that everybody's involved in discussion has ample time to get information and research and be prepared to participate and the second reason is that it, then it gives notice to the public of what's going to be on the agenda in terms of action items. Right. I would ask a clarifying question. Sure. What does normal business mean? Can you define it? Well, that's uh, normal would be, um, I guess another word for that would be routine, non-emergency. Yes, uh, certainly if uh, something unexpected uh, comes up, uh, then we can take action on that immediately. Uh, I'm just talking about the normal course of business of uh, like, sort of like what we just talked about with with uh, the, the pay. Uh, so that's more my, my concept of normal business. So it's subjective. Yes, but it's, I, I think you understand uh, the difference between emergency and quote unquote normal. But it so is it, subjective. 
in the case of, in such a case, I, I would think it would require the consensus of the board to set aside um, the precedent uh, in case of emergency it would need to be a decision by the board to do that. So would we always though have the ability as a board to determine whether or not we wanna make action or take action as a board? Uh, uh, that's my expectation. But we already have it. There are operating guidelines for us. And so if the majority of the board believes they wish to table something until the following meeting, well, there's procedure well, for doing so. Okay, well, my want is what I stated a minute ago. It's a big opportunity for the members of the board and for our staff to have opportunity to uh, review and uh, digest information that's been presented so that like right now, somebody doesn't say, uh, I want to make a motion to do da 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 without the without the ability of the board or staff to review it. So at that point, anyone who did so would not receive a second, potentially, or if they did, it would go to comment, and then someone would call the question, and then you would be able to have a majority of the board deem that they did not feel they had enough information to make a decision, and they can table the motion. Well, I, one thing that I think that is important to point out is that it doesn't give the public time to give them notice of the discussions that are taking place. And I think that's important that we let our public know something that I've noticed is um, on our agendas when somebody puts things on there is that they've been labeled as discussions. And something that I would uh, hope to see in the future is that if you put something on the agenda and you want to have a discussion about it, but you potentially have a, like a an action that's going to take place or follow that discussion, I think that should also be on the agenda. Any proposed action that you plan to take with a with a motion or any item that you put on the agenda, let us know where you where you're going with this. Like, what's your goal? So that there's transparency um, and that there's you're not hiding anything. Mr. Elliott, can you comment on what the standard practice is for our rules regarding bringing motions forward? Please. Well, I don't, I don't know if there's a standard set. I mean, obviously, Mayor Byers described how it goes for the city. So I guess if we're going to follow what the city's doing, it sounds like her recommendation is new business that get brought up, get pushed forward. I think that's what you said. Is that right, Mayor? And so we'll go forward to the next uh, meeting agenda. So I, I don't know that there's a specific standard for anybody, but I, I will tell you this much. It's definitely easier on me as legal counsel when I know issues are going to be talked about so I can be prepared to talk about them. <laughs> yeah, if there's, there's a also... recommendation that we have to have a motion already on the agenda, would be potentially putting ourselves into a situation where we would decide that there was an emergency and that we needed to make a motion, but now we've required ourselves to what call a special meeting and notice to the public for 24 hours and then have that special meeting and then take up the motion. That's a, that's a possibility, I'm sure. But I recently attended a, a really good class that YV Cog put on with Jurassic Parliament. And um, I think it goes back to having some kind of um, just baseline understanding of having a just decorum of, of how we need to uh, operate our business, um, operate these meetings. So I, I don't think we're trying to, to limit our, our duties and powers as Board of Health members, but we definitely need to be transparent of, of our actions being taken. Dr. Cleary? Um, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I think that it's important to allow the public some um, warning of what we are going to discuss. And it's important that there be something on the agenda ahead of time. Uh, I don't read your, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I, I don't read your motion as um, preventing someone from adding things to the agenda prior to the meeting. Um, it's just bringing up things at the meeting without being on the agenda with no forewarning uh, that we would like to avoid because uh, that makes it look like we're trying to push things through without the, the public's knowledge and without the preparation of the board. 
Uh, I'd like to add also that many of the decisions that we've made, when we make them very quickly, it's often very difficult as a government agency to respond to the needs of the community afterwards. There are many people who call us very confused about the decisions that are made in our board meetings. And it would be helpful if we had the time, as was discussed, to prepare so that we could explain to the board where there may be reservations that we have or the consequences of the decisions that are made. That's part of our job is to provide that advisory role to the board. Dr. Atterbury? Well, just so I'm clear um, and to clarify on Dr. Cleary's point, which I think in principle I agree with, um, the getting something on the agenda would then allow for it to be voted on at that next meeting or it would need to get on the agenda one meeting, sit and stew for another meeting and then it would actually get voted on at the second meeting. Do I have that clear in terms of process? So this would create some delay in action, which I think is what um, Amanda is referring to uh, when she says that, you know, we're creating a, a duplicate process or, or an, uh, a multi iterative process. Uh, not that I'm against that. I'm just suggesting, uh, do I have that right, Dr. Cleary or Dr. or Mr. Commissioner Anderson, uh, as to uh, how it would happen that if something were added to the agenda uh, within 48 hours of the meeting happening, could that item be? voted on in that particular meeting or would it have to wait till the next meeting my motion was just simply to as a like tonight if i had a topic as with this motion if i had a topic i wanted to have the board consider i would ask to have it uh information disseminated to the board and then uh action taken at the next meeting it's not concerning an emergency situation or anything else. It's normal topical stuff uh, that uh, we would normally take care of in our course of business. Mr. Anderson, I saw Ryan Ibach have his hand up if you don't mind. I'm sorry, go ahead, Ryan. Okay, yeah, just one comment on, um, according to Robert's rule of order, if an item is on the agenda, then it is um, able action can be taken and as, as Commissioner McKinney did state that there is a mechanism in place if more time, more information is needed then it can be tabled. So that's just how Robert's rule order works. Is if it's on the agenda already, then then it can be, action can be taken. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add two things to this. I mean, the motion as written says, uh, brought up that is not on the agenda. So I think that addresses one issue. Second, on the emergency question, th there's always an opportunity for an emergency meeting to happen. They're pretty limited under the opportunities that can be done, uh, but there, there is an opportunity to do that. And I think we've actually had one for this board way back in, I wanna say maybe May or June of last year, there was an emergency meeting that got set up. So that is another option in those emergent situations to have a meeting, to call it, to not do it on the normal meeting routine. So. Mr. Anderson, would it be your intent then that if someone brought up something that was uh, emergent, that you would then allow that to happen on the agenda for action for to proceed for a motion for at, with action by the board at that at that meeting? For instance, today, if there was an emergent action, or are you saying that you would like to propose that an, if something is not brought up and it's an emergent need, that it's brought up and a special meeting is called? No, uh, I think you understand the definition of emergency and normal. I am talking about normal and certainly any item that or a situation that might be con considered an emergency, we need to take action uh, as, as demanded by that emergency. At that, at that meeting at that time? If we need to call emergency meeting, we can do so at any time. I'm just talking about normal uh, business uh, items here that in the normal course of business that uh, the health district would take care of. And I think you understand that. I really, at this point, don't. I'm not sure if you're saying that in a, if someone brought forward something today, new business, and felt it was emergent, are you saying that you would then have it be placed on the agenda for a next meeting and potentially a special If you meeting? or anyone brought forth an item that you felt was an emergent, the, the board could discuss it. And if we decided that it was an emergency, the action could be taken. Are you saying emergent or emergency? Emergency. 
Yeah, I think that's I think that's key. I, you know, emergencies are things that are life and death situations. Um, I think several times during our um, meetings, we take up new motions and we start discussing those and we have an allotted two hour time for our board meetings. And sometimes a lot of the times actually they go way past that. And we need to respect the time of all of our board members, public watching, the staff members who um, I know in some cases have our meetings have gone over and they have other meetings that they have to attend to, like speaking to nurses in the past. And those meetings are put on hold and everyone in that meeting is waiting because we are still having our meeting well past an hour or even longer. I think that's what we're trying to avoid. Uh, we're also trying to avoid again not being transparent with the public i think that's my my biggest thing is that um people again have said that they were going to take action at a meeting and and that was not at all the case on our agenda um and they have said it on the radio and that was not the case on our agenda either uh, so i think this is a really good motion to put forward so that we are being um transparent with the public I am all for uh, transparency, very much so. So I guess I'm saying that if if it's, it's subjective, so if that's if someone wants to bring something forward and they believe it's a, it's an emergency, that's the subjective part. So again, it's up to the board ultimately to decide whether or not something's normal, or if enough people on the board believe it's an emergency. Correct. True. I'd I'd also like to add, if I may, that I know that COVID has been um, a tremendous. Um, responsibility and concern not only to our board but to the public uh, but there are other mandated services and services that we provide in the community that we'd like to be able to share with you on a routine basis to explain the workings of the health district and certainly our commitment and responsibility to meet and exceed those mandated responsibilities but often we don't have time for that because uh, we are in discussion around issues that we had not planned for so I think if we would be, again, if there was more routine with our board meetings, we'd be able to accomplish more on behalf of both the board and the community. Any further comment or discussion? We had a, we had a, a, a motion and a second. Uh, Ryan, would you please uh, poll and uh, take for a vote as to moving this forward to next meeting or not? You're on, you're on mute. So whether to move it forward to the next meeting and not actually vote on the motion? We wanna, we wanna, I want, I'm asking for a vote on the motion to move it forward. Oh, okay. For okay. A vote for okay. A so call a question. Is that what you want? You want us to vote? On moving it forward to the next meeting, yes. Actually, Mr. Uh, Mr. Anderson, if we, because it's been on the agenda as a proposed motion and was available to the public and the uh, board, I would think that we could actually vote on the motion tonight. Okay, that's fine yeah. with me. Yeah. Okay, so we'll vote on the motion as stated in the agenda. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, Dr. Clary. Aye. Uh, Commissioner McKinney. Nay. Commissioner Lindy. Aye. Uh, Mayor Byers. Yes. Council Member Duvall. Yes. Dr. Atterbury. Yes. And uh, uh, Commissioner Anderson. Yes. And the vote is six to one in favor of the motion. Thank you. Uh, now we'll move on to uh, the prop, uh, proposed motion uh, C, and no motion should contradict any state, federal, local laws, ordinances, or statutes and must adhere to the best interests of the public health and the goals and mission of the Yakima Health District. And uh, Dahlia, would you like to, uh, to comment? Yes, thank you. Um... Commissioner Anderson. Um, so 
for the five members that are elected officials, I hope that you had a chance to review your oath of office. I know that I asked for a copy of mine um, to make sure that I'm, I am carrying out my oath. And I think that's um, what makes me feel so uncomfortable with taking up motions that contradict um, laws, regulations, mandates, our state health officer and our local health officer. Um, and I strongly believe when, when this board entertains those motions, um, we are doing more harm than good. Um, and in doing so, we undermine our credibility and we contribute to the government mistrust. So um, I think board members need to stop politicizing this platform and focus on the public health of everyone in Yakima County. And that's why I'm bringing forward this motion. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Is that clear? I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? I guess I would add, um, Commissioner Anderson, that I, I don't think it's overly politicizing or even remotely politicizing. I think that when people bring forward um, ideas uh, to this committee and to this board, it's because they believe they are acting in the best interest of the public health of the people of Yakima County. I, don't, I can't think of a single instance where somebody brought forward something to this board that wasn't somehow veiled in the interest of the public health of the county. So I would just say, it seems that we are usurping our authority as a board and as an entity, if we say we're just gonna follow lockstep, everything stated to us by either the federal government or in this case, the state government, I think that 99% of the time we will fall in line with those entities. But every now and again, I think that a dissent of opinion is both reasonable. And if you look at uh, our history on this board over the last uh, six months that I've been a part of it, it seems that every time we've brought forward some controversial quote unquote topic, uh, it's been very shortly thereafter switched on the national or state front. So I think we're actually ahead of the curve in many cases. Uh, now, I'm certainly not suggesting that we should routinely uh, go against um, any state law. That's not at all what I'm suggesting. And please hear me when I say that, Mr. Elliott. Uh, what I'm suggesting instead is that the dissent of opinion is simply that. It's to bring forward an opinion that's of dissent, not to state that this has to be the only opinion voiced. I think that all of us play a role in that. So I'll, I'll yield. Okay, uh, Commissioner Lindy and then uh, Mayor Byers. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Anderson. Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, I, I appreciate uh, Ms. Duvall's, uh, you know, uh, her thought here on this. I, I think the part that gets difficult is when we say, you know, uh, a motion that's in the best interest of public health. And I, and I think the very problem is that we have different views of what's in the best interest of public health. Uh, that, that's, not a, that's not such a, you know, black and white thing because sometimes we're looking at one particular disease and while others are looking at a broader scope of, of the benefit to the public of certain directions. So I think this would be a, I think it would be a difficult motion to uh, put this into policy. I think it'd be very difficult to define. Um, Mayor Byers. Yes, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, I want to just agree with uh, both Commissioner Lindy and uh, Dr. Adbury in that uh, there are, we are here representing the community as representatives of different aspects of the community and the community has a lot of different opinions. And I think it's, it's fair uh, to our community that, that dissent of opinion be allowed in the discussion and views uh, taking place on the Board of Health. I, I think that to limit that to strictly the point of view of the state, uh, you know, does not accurately reflect, you know, our local community all the time. And I just think there's, there's room and, and time for a dissent of opinion. Director, uh, yeah, Commissioner Anderson, I'd like to share, um, I, I respect the idea of dissenting opinions, certainly robust conversations, and even the frustration that comes with 
uh, not liking the law. I recognize that. All of you are privileged to be in positions on our board, and many of you have positions outside of our community that allow you to have that platform, to have those conversations with elected officials, with state government, uh, and certainly um, as personal citizens. But I'd like to make a large distinction between dissenting and giving direction to the staff. We have had motions that would have put us in an illegal stance, that would have been in legal jeopardy. Those were voted down, but there were others where recommendations have been made. I still take very seriously the idea that the board would recommend that we do something that doesn't meet legal standard. And while it's true that there have been many changes that have happened on a week by week basis where something was legal one day and the next week it's not, um, I recognize that we abide by the law at all times here. And one of the things I'd like to clarify is that the work that we do often in public health is life or death consequences. It's not opinion, it's not dissent, it's not position, and it's not certainly my belief. It is what we have to do by state and federal law. So I'd like to make that distinction because one, I think it creates a, an uncomfortable space where our staff are saying politely that we will not follow your recommendation. I think it is confusing to the public. And I also don't think that we operate in a vacuum. We do not just take your recommendations. I serve at the pleasure of this board. And when we have dissent or direction that could be legal, that places me in a position to protect this agency. So I share that with you frankly, not because I wanna limit these conversations. I think robust conversations allow for, as you say, dissenting opinions. But when it moves from a, opinion to direction, it becomes very untenable. Thank you. Director Fresco, I'd like to respond to that and simply say, and acknowledging, uh, Nyla, you brought up our oath of office. Um, we did take an oath of office. And, and I remember most distinctly about that day is that I swore to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And that is above all what we are here for. And we have the pleasure of serving to represent the community, some of us, uh, an entire county. Uh, by last count, 258,200 people who, to Patricia Byers, our mayor of Yakima has just stated, are, are many differing opinions. And to your statement about life or death, Andre, you know, your subjective opinion about what life or death is, and many of these decisions are life and death, what's normal, what's an emergency, that's subjective. We all have a different point of view. And when we're talking about a pandemic, where, to Commissioner Lindy's point, when he's talking about uh, you know, this is unique, that there are folks who are looking at different, uh, pers from different perspectives through different lenses. Uh, and I will note that, I, and I appreciate Dr. Atterbury bringing up that, you know, motions that were brought forward that seemed radical, literally the next day, we had national movement on them. And that is not because the science changed. It's because the willingness to consider a different path by the powers that be changed. And we are the local authority as a health board who gets to determine what path is the best way forward for our community in Yakima County. And, and that is a distinct privilege. And I know that every single person on this board is concerned about the overall public health and well being of everyone in Yakima County. But we do have to consider everything. And it isn't that the science changes, it's who's reading the science and what other things are they considering. And when asked about uh, what, what I'm going to do on the health board, I know we all get emails, we all get questions. Uh, we're concerned about our, our, our elderly. We're concerned about our youth. We're all concerned about people who have uh, experienced COVID, have been hospitalized. We care about our community. To say that uh, it's reckless to have a contrary uh, opinion about what people are allowed to do in their personal lives, what decisions that they're able to make to say, I'm willing to take this risk. I'm willing to go out the door today or drive a car or let my child swim in a pond. I mean, there are countless opportunities for us to encounter risk daily. And I just wanna make sure that it's clear that any decisions that are made, it's because there is a true conviction that it is in the best interest of the public health. And then in regards to something that continues to come up with, with the masks, and I've talked about the, the mask mandate for our children. And I cannot see how we continue to uphold something locally when we have the ability to do something as, as simple as following simple thought process of knowing that the science says that people who are outdoors, anyone who's outdoors does not contract COVID in the outdoor setting. And yet we are forcing our children to wear a mask. And when you talk about undermining 
the faith in government. It's because our own CDC has finally come out and said that children do not have to wear masks outside at camp. But our own governor, because of his emergency power, has said that in Washington, it's different. In Washington, kids who want to attend camp need to quarantine for five days. In Washington, kids who want to go to camp must get a negative COVID test within three days of showing up. In Washington, a child who wants to go to camp, they must wear a mask all times, even outdoors at all times. And they have to socially distance at least six feet. And the only exception is to that are showering, swimming, eating, and brushing teeth. The science isn't different in Washington. COVID doesn't impact children in Washington any differently. And it is our role to be free thinkers and to determine the risk and ultimately have confidence and trust in our community members that they're going to make a decision that's best for them and their child and their family in whatever, ma whatever manner. And we have a blessing of having a vaccine that is readily available to everyone who wants it in our community and has been for quite some time. But it is time for us to move forward as a community and allow people to assess the risk that they wish to take every day going forward. And so I welcome your love for our community. I share it. And I believe that this board uh, will continue to act with the public health's interest in mind. And for that, I'm against your motion because it is subjective, uh, because what is best for overall public health is truly a subjective point of view. And that's because it's personal. Um, I'd just like to respond to two things, if I may. You had said in our last meeting that there are laws that we can choose to ignore. And I just want to share with you wholeheartedly that we're not at liberty to do that. I certainly would never direct our staff to do that. And when we talk about laws and direction from this board, I just want to respectfully again share that this organization as an independent public health jurisdiction um, operates under the direction of this board, but we also have to adhere to state and federal law. That is just the reality and the the boundaries in which we operate. So when the board gives direction to us that may be against federal or state law, that's a problem. And I'll always have to be able to point that out. Director Fresco, uh, do you think that there are counterparts in other states who decided like New York and Massachusetts to not recommend mask mandates in the same uh, lockstep as the CDC? What We have to actually look outside of our state too and acknowledge that there are people in our position and in your position, Director Fresco, and Dr. Yuka's position, who did buck the system. They said, you know what, CDC, that doesn't work for our community. Both our state, as it pertains to the federal government, or municipalities, smaller municipalities with regard to their state. And there are states across the United States who have reacted differently. That's what autonomy means. And there are people who have done so. So to assert that, I, I understand what you're saying, but there have been people who've done just so to set a new precedent for going forward. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Dr. Cleary. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, but I agree with uh, Andre that um, the, the basic thing here is we still have to follow the law, um, the state, federal, and local laws and ordinances. And it's fine that we have differences of opinions. And if we are clever, we will figure out uh, the best approach uh, that fits Yakima and the citizens of Yakima. Um, but we can't be making laws subjective. They are not subjective. Uh, a law is a law. And if you violate it, you have you've broken the law. There, there's no subjectivity to the law. And we've already seen that the Board of Health is now uh, embroiled in some issues because of that attitude. And I think this would just bring up liability. To, to not pass this, you are essentially saying that um, you will create motions that contradict the law. Uh, and I think that's incredibly irresponsible. If, if we have the intelligence uh, and the dedication to help the community, we will do it by following the laws and adjusting our response to what is best for the Yakima citizens. Nadia? I just want to make sure that um, if a board member hasn't had a chance to speak to speak before I do, because I, I appreciate your your input. OK, um, well, something that I that I want to also point out is that I think we can all agree on one thing. Um, I think we all want this pandemic to be over where we disagree is on on how to get there, on how what's the best path or approach in doing so. Um, so again, I really don't think that motions that contradict 
the mission of, of the Yakima Health District um, is not in our favor. We need to recognize our influence um, and and know that you know what is know our goals. Know, what is our goal? What is the goal of this motion? Is it does is it aligned with with the Yakima Health District missions and goals and and our jobs and our duty um, outlined in in the RCW? Um, and and is there maybe a better way to address our concerns or our opinions? Um, so do you do you think that bringing up motions or entertaining motions that are against the law is that the best way to to get what you want? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I think everyone's had opportunity to uh, uh, speak. Uh, I will ask one more time if there's any more comment. I'd like to call for the question. Question has been called. Uh, Ryan, would you please uh, poll the members? Okay. So we're voting on the motion as stated. Um, so if you're in favor of the motion, please state yes. If not, state no. Um, actually, I don't think we've read the motion into this meeting, so I just want the public to know what it is. Okay. So the motion um, as stated is no motion should contradict any state, federal, local laws, ordinance, ordinances, or statutes that must adhere to the best interests of public health and the goals and missions of the Yakima Health District. Uh, Dr. Clary? Yes. Commissioner McKinney? Nay. Commissioner Lindy? No. Mayor Byers? No. Uh, Council Member Duvall? Yes. Uh, Dr. Atterbury? No. And Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Okay, so the favor or um, the motion is three yeses and four noes. Thank you. Now we will move on to new business and uh, under A, I think we've pretty well discussed that point, uh, but we can f discuss it further. Uh, we are right now in a special meeting and these meetings were originally uh, created uh, as a format to allow for more uh, discussion in between our regular monthly meetings. Uh, as, uh, so you may read, well, the three of us anyway, three commissioners and the staff certainly, uh, would uh, remember when we were doing daily morning briefs and uh, and uh, getting that information that way about how things were going. And then uh, as time moved on, we uh, decided to move into this uh, broader uh, meeting, evening meeting uh, concept in between our regular morning meetings, once a month morning, morning meetings. So I'm just, it's not a motion. <laughs> I'm just suggesting that we are at a point where I think we can uh, discontinue these meetings and if need be expand our monthly morning meetings. So uh, Commissioner Anderson, I'm going to agree with you that special meetings should be reserved for that. Just something that is out of the ordinary and, and needs more immediate action or a, a deeper look before action is taken. Uh, so I think having them on a regular schedule basis is not necessary. Uh, particularly as things have begun to slow down some that we can accomplish uh, most of our business in a regular uh, scheduled business meeting. And if we need to have a special meeting, then we can do that. For example, the special meeting to have the interviews for the uh, health officer. Thank you. I would just comment that because of the fact that we continue to run over on our meetings, even though we're having them twice a month, uh, supports enough continuing the twice a month meetings. I would say as long as we have an emergency order called by our governor and there are continued daily changes uh, to the mandates he makes to Andre's credit for bringing that up, that we are going to need to be uh, convening consistently. I think every other week, as long as he continues, we don't even know what's going to happen on June 30th. You know, the governor has said that he is potentially going to open us up. We're continuing to get new guidelines that come down from L and I. Um, there are so many things that are impacting our community, and I believe as long as there are things that we need to interpret and act on under the emergency order, we owe it to the public to meet at least twice a month. 
I would uh, second uh, that opinion and state that um, we have been going over on our twice a month meetings. So the idea that unless we're going to have an eight hour once a month meeting, uh, which I'm not sure anybody's going to volunteer for, um, then I think we should continue at least until the emergency order from the governor is over. I would I would also say that as soon as it's over, we should go to once a month uh, meetings as soon as that's practical. Other comments? I guess I yeah I can add to the to the chorus here. I think uh, uh, yeah I would think that uh, yeah our meetings at this point still have been pretty long. We haven't had a shortage of material to talk about, and I think uh, hopefully we're close to the point where we can do that. And I, I think that's when the emergency orders are over and we we go back to something which we would consider pretty close to normal. I think until we get there, I, I'm not quite ready to 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 change from the twice a month format. Thank you. Any other comment? Well, I just um, also like to point out that, you know, I I have another job outside of this and I think uh, maybe some other people don't. But um, for me, it is a hardship when we go over our two hour, uh, two hour allotted time for our, our meetings. I do want I do hope that you recognize that it's a hardship for my job and the people that need me. I work at a school. Um, this is during um, this is during the school day and it's a crucial time where I need to be in the office. And um, there has never been a meeting uh, that we ended at 1030 when we were when we were supposed to. Uh, an emergency comes up and I think that we need to respect the time that is set on our agenda. Um, and, and until we can get through that meeting, or maybe we even need to propose a, a different time, um, for our, our regular business meeting. Dr. Cleary. Um, well, I, I think this is new business that's going to be discussed at the, the next meeting, which may be the time when, um, these restrictions are lifted by the governor. And so I don't think we need to schedule anything until we've had our next meeting. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Uh, Commissioner Anderson, Patricia Byer has had her hands up. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Andre, and thank you. I think everybody's had a chance to respond at this point. So I'm willing to just kind of concede to the conversation of the group. I realize that we are still under emergency orders. I think it would be more effective if we stayed in our two hour limit and limited it to, uh, limit it to the two hour limit and having two, two meetings a month until we can move back to one. Okay, thank you. Any other comment? All right, well, I think the consensus is that we're gonna stay the course. So we will go on to the next item, which is discussion on policy allowing the board to review communication towards minors prior to being dis distributed to the public without limiting the health district staff on daily communications. This, uh, Commissioner Lindy. Yes, well, it, um, as you know, this all came out of uh, the the, uh, the vaccine uh, competition and, and the uh, marketing surrounding that. Um, it's not my goal to uh, um, you know tie the hands of the of the board, but it seems like uh, or, or of the district. But I think there are some things where there might be sensitive subjects uh, that that maybe warrant uh, a discussion or vetting through the board ahead of time. And I'm not. You know, it says they're on minors, and I think there's there's value to that, but that might not be the only, uh, you know, time when there might be something that needs to be, you know, discussed or vetted with the board ahead of time. I don't really have a, a preconceived uh, notion of what that might be. I just wanted to open this up and, and uh, for conversation and see if we uh, might be able to establish some kind of policy in that sense. And I guess the other thing I would add to that, I, I'm I'm a little I'm a little disappointed that we we don't have another ad campaign for our students, because even though there were concerns about the way this was being uh, done in the high schools, I still uh, I still think it's a good idea to get our young people vaccinated and uh, would just, uh, you know, was just hoping for a different approach that were involved, the, you know, the parents in the marketing. It wasn't, uh, in, in my, from my point of view, this was not a, an anti-vaccine statement in any way, just, uh, just that we take a, a, a different approach. Other, other comments? I just want to kind of uh, second what Commissioner Lindy was saying. 
that my objection was in terms of uh, how the material was presented without making an emphasis on uh, the fact that, you know, it's a, it's a discussion, a family discussion, and the ultimate decision is up to the parents. And I think of that, you know, there was a situation created where the use of peer pressure, you know, kind of circumvented that. So that was my concern, not that we have educational materials out there. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was the last topic on our agenda for tonight. Um, have we, so are we, <laughs> are, are we moving forward with an, with a discussion towards, are we, to Commissioner Lindy's point, I believe. I have a hard time hearing you, Amanda, I'm sorry. I believe that Commissioner Lindy, the point though was to discuss, do we want to set up a policy of the board reviewing marketing materials? Right, so uh, are you uh, interested in making a motion to move forward or have it on the next agenda, uh, Commissioner Lindy? Well, I guess I, I guess I was just hoping to start with a discussion of what a policy might look like. I don't think we we okay. necessarily take any action tonight, but I, no. but I was you know, okay. seeking input from the board on which we, we might be able to go on this. I, I think uh, uh, there is a value, and I think even a, I think even a security or a safety for the health district in some regard by uh, deciding on certain topics or certain uh, you know areas where maybe we ought to have this discussion in a vetting ahead of time. Uh, Commissioner Anderson, I, I can respond, but I'd like to do so after uh, certainly giving an opportunity to the board members. Yeah, I, so I guess I'm, I'm kind of confused because um, I just want to point out again our influence as board members, even though the those may not have been your ten, intentions, uh, a campaign was canceled. So um, I don't think that I don't want to be the type of board member that is going to micromanage the staff's time on, you know, what marketing material is going to be used or how they're going to get vaccines in, um, in everybody's arms. Like, I think, you know, we need to let them do their job. And if we are reviewing every little piece of thing that they do, it's going to be very hard for them to to be successful in ending this pandemic. I guess I would just voice that um, the campaign that was ended was a peer pressure oriented campaign for a health intervention. And I think that the majority of the board absolutely endorses the idea of young people getting vaccinated. What they did not like about that was the peer pressure nature of it without adult discussion which by definition, none of the people that you're talking about are consentable in age, unless they're emancipated minors. I guess I'll give that exception, but short of that exception, there isn't such a thing as a, as a consenting minor. There is, there is discussions that should be created. And I think that some of us had concern about peer pressure being the discussion technique as to whether a health intervention was going on, not the idea young people should not get vaccinated because I think all of us would endorse it. I know uh, my two kids that are eligible are both vaccinated. So it gives you my, my take on it. Um, and I would, I would recommend that to anybody who I talk to on the topic is vaccination is a good idea. I think Dr. I Perry, have you had an opportunity? I haven't. Go ahead. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, I would say that by statute, the health board sets the policies for the health staff to administer. And so it is vital that we're involved in these discussions. And I would, I would say that clearly any kind of education materials that are created from the health district are sending a message to the public about a policy and a stance that we're taking as a health district as far as what we're recommending. And Again, uh, I know that um, several have spoken about this. The, the issue that was taken was number one at the board meeting when it was mentioned that this uh, material was uh, going to be, had been created and was going to be disseminated to youth under the age of 18 minors. Uh, the board did make very clear that that was something there was a consensus that we had um, hesitancy towards and that in fact, uh, I believe I asked Director Fresco directly, do I need to make a motion 
to preclude the staff from disseminating this information before the board could review and approve it. Uh, and, and I believe uh, because I, I made that request and then the documents uh, were sent out and the contest was started, uh, that caused a clear, um, a clear issue with the board clearly stating that they were against setting a policy by way of disseminating marketing or education material. Uh, and I believe that's probably the crux of why it was stopped so quickly. Um, but I do think it's important to recognize that that is one of our roles. Our role, again, is to help craft how we deal with public health crisis in our community and what we perceive are going to be the best options for our local community to take those actions necessary individually to respond to, to a health crisis. And so we should be active. That, that is our role by nature. We are not here to be rubber stamps. Uh, we are here to provide input. Those of us who are elected are here to represent those people who uh, elected us uh, and that larger body. And then we have citizen representatives as well. And that, that is our role. And I would liken it to our state legislature willingly uh, giving up their authority to be our voice by creating such a vague and broad emergency order providing those powers to our governor. It is our role to have an opinion and to provide guidance because we are the voice of the community. Thank you, Dr. Cleary. Um, well, I, uh, once again, I think we ought to look to other sources of uh, guidance. Um, I'm sure this is not a, a new topic among public health departments and uh, departments of health. And there are probably guidelines uh, out there that uh, we can follow that um, indicate uh, how to prepare educational materials for minors, how to involve parents, um, and I, I get a little concerned when the, it's questioned whether we want to keep that word minor in there, um, because at some point we do have to um, give the public health officer uh, some degree of autonomy, some ability to um, affect the mission of the department. But I think we should, um, at the next meeting, uh, be provided with some of uh, national guidance uh, uh, from other departments of health. You know, if I could interject here, I think Dr. Cleary brings up a good point, which is there must be other models out there. And if we could look in, have that looked into and see, okay, what are other districts, uh, you know, uh, health districts doing? I'm sure there, there are policies out there that we don't have to just invent, invent one out of thin air. Might be uh, good to look, uh, look into that. And I don't know if that's from, uh, you know, health district administration or Mr. Elliott looking into that. I don't know what's the best approach. Mr. An Commissioner Anderson, is this, may I respond? Yes. Thank you. So one of the things that we brought up was a very large concern around reaching, and we use the term minor, but the very large concern was around educating directly to 12 year olds. This particular process was for high school. And one of the things that is complicated by this is that in public health, we often are communicating best practices that have to do with young people. Um, and so one of the difficulties for me is that we are in the middle of an emergency. And I think that if we weren't in an emergency, we would have time afforded to have longer conversations about the expectation. And as you uh, mentioned appropriately, uh, Commissioner McKinney, the direction from the board, I think those are all fine things, but I don't want to sugarcoat this. There are issues that we face and have to address in our community that affect young people and dramatically impact their lives that are not pleasant conversations. So when we talk about best practices, there are best practices in, in public health that I think will surprise you. And I share that with you earnestly because we have teen pregnancy in this community. We have um, trauma in this community. We have issues that are very dramatic and they do impact young people and we have to protect them. And we also have a community often of people who are new um, to um, English. And so often those young people communicate to their families. And so they play a role as trusted communicators, ironically. And uh, I share this with you honestly, because there is no easy answer to these issues. Um, we will have more time to discuss them. I'm looking forward to that because we haven't had the privilege of sharing these best practices around public health. And I, I would like more of that, but also in the environment that we're in, which seems to be more contentious than I'm comfortable with, it's difficult to build that bond of trust and 
belief in one another. And I'm going to ask again that we work on becoming partners on these public health uh, initiatives rather than adversaries. Thank you. Uh, any further comment? I just would comment that I agree that we're all working towards the greater goal, but having a differing opinion does not mean it has to be adversarial. I also think that, again, we're talking about things that are very subjective. And when you say that there are things that you feel that as a public health official, that it is your role uh, to carry that message, that also means that you run the potential of circumventing the role of the parent or guardian. And that is something that's very delicate and sacred, and we do have to protect that. And so I, I just would keep that in mind that, again, this was, to put it in context, these were videos of teenagers being shown in a school place setting to other teenagers without the presence of their adult or guardian. And these teenagers were telling the other teenager in the video that they should go get the vaccine if they wanted to protect their grandparents. And they should go get the vaccine if they wanted to play sports again. And they should go get the vaccine if they loved their community and cared about the community which any young person is going to infer that if they had not yet received the vaccine or their parent to the contrary had decided at that point not to give it to them, they would then walk around with that heavy burden on their, soul, their shoulders that they were somehow a threat to their community because they did not do this thing that they heard in school from a peer in that high peer pressure setting was something that they should go do. And, and that is the whole point that because these children, these impressionable children are seemingly uh, without parent, parental guardians there to advise them as to why, maybe why their family had not yet done so, they're going to go home to your point as you want them to, to their parent. But because that parent potentially has made a decision that's contrary to what you believe as a public health expert, you have now invited in a family dynamic because you've injected yourself into this child's life in a school setting. So I, I concur that there are many people who are able to, uh, they're not able to understand uh, English, which is why we do such a good job uh, of having uh, Spanish uh, marketing. And I believe very strongly that because of the capabilities you've already demonstrated in reaching people in Spanish speaking part of our community, that you would be able to have a campaign that was directed towards adults and they certainly would be able to know that they could speak to their children if they felt like they needed to have greater clarification or to your credit, come and seek you out uh, because, and, and you're everywhere. The pop-up clinics are everywhere. It's a blessing. I think they're probably on every corner. Uh, and, and that again is to the credit of the health district with the work of FEMA, but we've done an exceptional job reaching all of our community in that sense. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner uh, Lindy, uh you uh, brought this forward. Uh, what would we've had a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, points made, a lot of uh, uh, views shared. Uh, what is your pleasure? Well, I, I guess I would like to just simply request that uh, at this point uh, that we we do a, a search to see what kind of policies might be used out there in uh, local uh, health districts in the state or around the nation that might be a model for us to consider. We can certainly do that. Okay, thank you. Thank I, you. I would agree with that. I think that um, even though it was a, a uh, difficult situation for a lot of people to see this going on, it brought about some robust conversation in, in the board itself, in the Board of Health. And I look forward to future discussions, Andre, on the best practices that, that you know you can share with the board that have been used uh, you know, in the field and in other areas. So we have an opportunity to talk about those things and, you know, what that will mean in our community. So I look forward to that. I look forward to robust conversations. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Any further comments or discussion? I would just know that we've got a, it doesn't look like we have an update from Dr. Yuk and I just wanted to see if that was an oversight. Uh, well, normally our update from Dr. Yuk is at our normal board meeting, um, Commissioner McKinney. So he has no comment, nothing, no updates. Oh, uh, well, he, he can speak for himself, Dr. Yucca. <laughs> Not much since the last, uh, things are going well. It looks like we're getting a little bump from the 
Memorial Day. And, uh, but hopefully that'll only be for a few more days. And uh, we, we're still over the 100 mark. So uh, we're still at a high level in community spread, uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll continue to go down. And um, uh, really, I'd, I'd just like to thank the staff again. They're really working hard for you people. And uh, <clears throat> I know you have robust conversations. <clears throat> the Board of Health, is, uh, yours is different than any Board of Health I've ever sat on. So uh, <laughs> I will say that. <laughs> we'll take that as good. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Yucca, I was just wondering if you could comment or, or anybody on the staff about the Delta variant and any uh, spike we've seen in relation to the Delta variant of the, of the COVID virus. Uh, for Yakima, it's, it's mainly the California variant is what in Yakima County. It's different than any other county in the, in the state. I don't know why, Dr. Adbury. It's, it's really, you know, and, and this seems to be the overwhelming one. We haven't really seen that one here in Yakima County. Uh, Dr. Adbury, I can share a little if you don't mind. Uh, the Delta variant is, is, is highly destructive uh, uh, overseas, uh, as you know. And because of places like India that are their, 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 their medical systems, their public health response is crumbling uh, because of the sheer size and complexity, I think that the spread there is dramatic and very dangerous. Uh, I would anticipate that it comes here, but I would also hope, given the fact that we um, are committed to vaccination, that the impacts to our community, while the variant will inevitably attack people, will not result in dramatic hospital stays or death. That is our goal. Terrific. Thank you. That's you know, great information. Uh, Commissioner Anderson, I was hoping if, if we have a chance to have a small update on uh, our interview process from Ryan and myself. Um, before um, that, I think um, Melissa Sixbury was gonna make a comment and I'd, I'd like to hear from her too. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Duval. Um, I was just going to add to the communications piece that there are some things that do not require parents' consent, such as mental health and sexual health. Those are things that can be done and consented by a child at 13 and 14, respectively, that I think is very important for future messaging to be given by public health who has evidence-based messaging uh, rather than hearing it from their friends or social circles. So uh, just keep that in mind for future communications planning as well, that there is some that doesn't require parental consent. Thank you. Okay, um, where were we? <laughs> uh, uh, we were Andre and Ryan. Andre. Andre. If we were switching to a new topic, we were gonna even update on the uh, interviews. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Uh, go ahead, uh, Ryan. Okay, so today we had our first interview, um, Dr. Kate interviewed, and then tomorrow at five o'clock, we have Dr. Atterbury, and at six o'clock, we have Dr. Bard. Um, and then at next board meeting, the regular board meeting on June 30th, uh, we, we can have discussion on the qualifications of the, um, of the candidates. And that is, does qualify for executive session to, to only discuss the, um, the qualifications of, of candidates and, and um, any decisions that are gonna be made need to be done in regular um, open meetings. So after, after that executive session, if uh, the board would like to vote on uh, the next health officer could do that after the executive session and that will be beyond our agenda. And, um, and, and uh, part, part of the board packet um, for the June 30th meeting, we'll have all the scores of all the candidates and how each, each of the board members scored each of the candidates and that will be open public record. Thank you. James, is there anything else you'd like to cover? You're asking me, Andre? Yes, about executive session, anything? Yeah. No, I mean, to the extent that the board on June 30th wants to have those discussions about the qualifications to the candidates that can be done again, and we'll we'll do that, go in the executive session to the extent you want those discussions. And again, I'll give you the reminder about the things we cannot do and the things that we can do in advance, so. Thank you. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add, Commissioner Anderson, is that we had had direction from the board about scoring, uh, scoring being the purview of the board members. 
There was some discussion about executive session and including myself, Ryan and Melissa. Uh, there were perspectives shared, but I'd like to reiterate the need um, for us to advise you on that process. Uh, we've got folks here at the health district who have spent decades in public health and, and in public service and medicine, um, and we'll be working closely with these individuals. So I think it's necessary uh, to hear that perspective. And that's one of the reasons why we have the um, opportunity to discuss in an executive session, but I wanna make sure that we're following the direction of the board. I think that the board has made it clear that we appreciate your input and you are involved in interviews, but we do not need you at the executive session, but I thank you. I guess my question would be at what point do you have our input? We'll have copies of your scoring. Uh, we were directed not to score. Well, great. So I think that when we come out of executive session, we can ask you any clarifying questions that we may have. Uh, again, I, I think that's uh, missing the point, which is that part of this responsibility, which is difficult for me, is that this public health department are dedicated public servants who understand and have committed their career to public service are not being allowed the opportunity to share their perspective on a position, which is very pivotal. I'm so not talking about already voted director Fresco. I'm so sorry, ma'am. No, we have not. We we really didn't, and I apologize. I um, my understanding is that you shared your perspective. If I understand correctly, Dr. Cleary shared his perspective, but I don't think that was a vote. I'm sharing with you that uh, we are not looking to influence. We're simply looking to advise on best practices in public health for a position which is often filled for many years. And so the choices that you make will have an impact on the working environment, the public service that we provide, and certainly the public health practices of this department. I'll just add that we do a lot more than just COVID here at the health district. We manage every communicable disease uh, for this county. And so having knowledge about those, we're managing five active complicated tuber tuberculosis cases right now that um, need some expertise behind them. So there, I think it would be very important for uh, staff who work closely with the health officer to have some type of input that we could offer whether we're not scoring or not. And I, I think it's also important to note that um, Commissioner Liddy did did reach out to me in January to say that our the staff input is very important to um, the commissioners and that they wanted our input and I think that would be uh, fitting in an executive session to be able to give input. So I will say that the city and hiring our new city manager went through a process where we actually had each candidate had three interviews, one with a um, one with a, a citizen representative uh, group, and one with the staff group, and then one with the um, council. And then uh, having what was given to the council after the other interviews were the uh, the scoring sheets or remarks by the citizen group and the staff and then we we took that into executive session with us uh so i think having i don't I'm not trying to define what the input should be but i think it is important to have an input from the the um, health department from the staff in the health department Any other um, yeah i would actually like go ahead dr clary your hands been up before me oh um thank you uh, well, I would just like to say that um, I would really like their input. Um, we all have to recognize that uh, our time on the board is very limited, um, but the staff or the health department are the experts uh, who are going to be working with this public health officer long after we're gone. And it's, it's very um, important that we respect their experience with working with a public health officer. I would certainly like their input. Um, I, I can't imagine... Uh, how we could be harmed by gaining information from the people that are most knowledgeable and going to work with this individual. Nalia? As long as I'm not, oh, sorry. Uh, I actually just wanted to, to maybe poll you guys. Um, would it be okay if we had the staff fill out the scoring matrix? That way we can take it into executive session? Or would you rather have them in an executive session. I would rather they be able to provide actual comments. I, I find that it, just scoring those individual questions doesn't really answer everything. And it's it's kind of an artificial scoring system. And I, I would prefer their uh, actual personal input. Would it be I think that if they, oh, I'm sorry, I'll wait till my turn. 
What about um, rather than the scoring, they can comment about their overall, uh, you know, overall comments regarding uh, the quality or concerns that they might have about each candidate, and they can have a written response that we can take with us into executive session. My only response that was going to be, we could do both. They could give us the scores, but they could also give us their uh, summary comments on candidates. Okay. Uh, just a point of clarification. I, I appreciate the uh, the perspective, but I don't think it's appropriate for us to score given the fact that the process has already begun. And again, the direction from our board was not to score. And so we did not score. And so in fairness, I don't think it's appropriate to go back after the fact. So uh, that's the only clarification I'd like to give. I noted that as well. So I, that's why I made the, the suggestion that perhaps an overall commentary would be appropriate. Well, my, my thoughts were to uh, allow them to be part of the conversation in executive session, not to advocate, but for clarification points or for information uh, that we may need as far as uh, clarifying some kind of an issue. Um, before I make a comment, can I ask James Elliott whether I'm allowed to make a comment? <laughs> You can make yeah. you can make a comment, Dr. Atterbury. Okay, well, in that case, I would encourage uh, the the staff's input as they have to work directly with the health officer. So it would make perfect sense to me that their their voices might be heard. Uh, I, I would imagine they could only be helpful in making the decision that uh, all of you have to make. Thank you, Doctor. Further comment. I think we need to decide for the sake of the board right now is how we are going to take their input. Are we going to have them in for, you know, at least partially for part of the executive session, give them an opportunity to speak and then and then have them step out of the session? Or are we going to take it in written format? Well, the, as you know, uh, Mayor, uh, executive sessions are just for discussion and not for any action. Right. I understand that. So I don't I, know I think what she's saying to me is a good idea is that we can have them begin so that we can ask them any questions, clarifying questions that we that we have. Uh, as you say, uh, Commissioner Anderson, not to advocate for one or the other, but simply to ask questions and then they can leave uh, and we can have further discussion uh, as a board. Any further comment? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I guess I just say I'm not too particular on how we get the input, but I think there's a place for their input. Yeah. Okay. And then we should um, input. There's been a lot of conversation here and some points made. Is anyone, would anyone want to entertain a motion? Is this considered normal business? It is because it's ongoing. Um, I'd like to put a motion on our next agenda. Um, my motion will be um, to allow the staff to provide written comments and to be part of the executive session. Our next meeting doesn't occur for two more weeks. Actually, three weeks. Next meeting's on the 30th, I think. Yeah, I'm just worried about the timing. Uh, is, is this one of the times when the board can reach consensus about, about uh, making a motion acting on it? Um, is this urgent? About a decision needs to be made. Shall we say that this there is, is a deadline? <laughs> yeah, there is a deadline involved here, and that's why putting it off into the next mm -hmm. business meeting may be difficult. Very well okay. said, Mayor Byers. Okay, so is that a motion? And uh, restate your motion then, uh, Nalia, yeah, if you would. Okay, then. So I'd like to uh, make an amendment to my motion uh, to have it be taken up today uh, due to the deadline of, of uh, the comments and our decision that has to be made. So my motion is to allow the staff to provide comments and to be part of the executive session. Is there a second? Uh, second. I would ask Sir, uh, submit written comments, sorry. And which staff? 
the ones that are in our that are participating in our um, interviews. Okay, so Mr. So, Ibach, Mr. Fresco, and Ms. Sixbury. Just making sure we're clear. Did I hear a second? Yes, I second that motion as restated. As restated to include uh, Director Andre and uh, Ryan and, and Melissa. Yes. Okay. Been moved and seconded. Oh, been moved and seconded. Any further comment? I would just say, is there is there a possibility for a friendly amendment for point of clarification that I would welcome the uh, the written comments and I'd welcome them in the meeting. But I'm hoping that there can be a time where they can they can leave the meeting and we can have a conversation at the board. Would the, well, the maker of the motion uh, uh, and the second would they uh, entertain uh, that amendment? I'll second that and allow that amendment. Doctor, and I'll second that. Okay, right, thank you. As amended. Okay, thank you. Do we need a? Are we going to vote, vote on the amendment? amendment? Yeah. You do need to vote on the amendment to make it. Yes. Yeah. Nalia? Nalia could. Nalia? Yes, could you, Nyla. Could, could okay. You, I'm, I'm writing it down. Oh, <laughs> okay. I, while she's writing that, if I could interject, I, I, I think uh, most everybody's calling uh, Ms. Duvall uh, Nalia, but her, her yes. name is N-A-I-L-A, which would be pronounced Nyla. That's so, correct. Uh, Thank you. Nalia is a much more common Spanish name than Nyla, but uh, with the, yeah, that Thank would be Nyla, actually. Thank you, Commissioner Lundy, for, for reminding us of that. I'm sure Nyla appreciates that as well. I do. I got to look at the vowel. There's too many vowels, right? <laughs> the vowels are front loaded in that name, yes. Okay, I think I got it. All right, so the motion as amended is allow staff to participate by providing written comment and to be part of the executive session. The, the first part of the executive session That was that was the amendment. Yeah, is that I was just was trying to ask um, Commissioner Lindy if that's what his amendment was. I think that would serve the purpose because you have a separation between uh, the first and the second part of the meeting. I, I'm, okay. I'm I would request we name the staff so it's clear that we're talking about three staff. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, are we ready? No, I'm still writing it down. So it's Andre, Melissa, and Ryan. Uh -huh. Okay, so again, the motion is to allow staff participating in interviews. Um, Mr. Fresco, Melissa Sixberry, and Ryan Ibeck to provide written comments and to be part of the first part of the executive session. Is that acceptable to you, Commissioner Lindy? It is. Okay. Call that's, to question. That's a friendly amendment. Uh, call for a question. Okay. Uh, we need to vote on the amendment. Uh, so Ryan, would you take a poll on that? Okay, so voting on the amendment would be adding the the, the first part for for the executive session. Um, Dr. Atterbury would not be able to vote on this. Correct. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Clary on the amendment. Aye. Okay. Um, uh, Commissioner McKinney. Aye. Commissioner Lindy. Aye. Mayor Byers. Yes. Council Member Duvall. Yes. And Mr. Anderson. Uh, aye. 
Okay. So the okay. amendment is a six to zero vote. Okay. Thank you. Now we will move to the uh, motion uh, as uh, presented by uh, member uh, Duval. Uh, Do you want to repeat it? Like that, please. <clears throat> okay. The motion, main motion is allow staff participating in interviews, Andre Fresco, Melissa Sixbury, and Ryan Ibeck to be the first to be in the sorry, in interviews to provide written comments and to be part of the first part of the executive session. Do I need to repeat that? <laughs> no, okay. Ryan owes you big time though, Nyla, because he's usually the one who takes these down. You just give him a big favor. And he's <laughs> Did you get it, Ryan? Got it. Okay. Got it. All right. That was very good of you to do that. Thank you, Nyla. Okay, that was restated. Do we need to re, re uh, have a, a redo on the second motion? Uh, second on that. Yeah, this time what we're affirming is the entire amended motion. Okay, thank you. Yes. So it's been moved and seconded uh, as amended. Uh, Ryan, would you like to take the poll, please? I would love to. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Clary. Yes. Uh, Commissioner McKinney. Hi. Commissioner Lindy. Yes. Mayor Byers. Yes. Council Member Duvall. Yes. And Commissioner Anderson. Yes. Okay. And it's uh, the vote is six zero in favor. All right. Well, I think uh, we got that simple thing taken care of. Uh, um. It? Well, there's just one more thing, Commissioner Anderson. It looks like we may be concluding our meeting early. <laughs> How did that ever happen? Is that a problem? <laughs> I just wanted to forewarn everyone. You can stay on if you want. I, I, I plan to be here. <laughs> Is there any uh, other comments? Uh, if not, I will ask. I think a motion to adjourn to our next scheduled business meeting. There's been a motion. Is there a second? I second it. And moved and seconded to adjourn until our next uh, scheduled meeting. Brian. Or do I just say all those in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 Any opposed? Good, because if you were if you were opposed, you were going to stay behind. <laughs> all right. We'll see everyone tomorrow. tomorrow. We. Uh, Thank you Thank much. You. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank you. Very good meeting, by the way, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Chase. <laughs>